It is six o'clock and welcome to the special broadcast of Full View. We're coming to you live from the Cape Town International Convention Center. And this is a special broadcast between the SABC and audit firm BDO South Africa. Shortly on the stage, we are going to hear from SARS Commissioner Edward Kisvetter, renowned economist Dr. Tabi Leoka and Kevin Lings, and tax guru for BDO SA, David Wanaka. In his 21-page address, that's how long it took the finance minister to tell us what's what in South Africa, he forgot about the flowers, he forgot about the props and the gospel verses and went straight into it. It was a straight talk budget about how we get South Africa out of the crisis it's in and back into stability. We will have a riveting discussion over the next 60 minutes covering some of the highlights and marquee topics from yesterday's budget address. So let's get it started and I'll kick off um, with our hosts from BDO. David Wanaka, lovely to see you again. Um, the minister styled this as a bold budget, and he also said there were no major tax proposals. To my mind, it felt like he wanted a slow clap, not only um, in the room, but around the country. Let's talk about what this means in his announcements yesterday for corporations and individuals. Because let's face it, we had a bumper tax collection year. We've exceeded our, ex uh, our, our, our estimates by 94 uh, billion rand, and revenue projections are 6 billion rand higher than they were last year. Yes, evening, all that, uh, that's quite right. Um, I think we all breathe a collective sigh of relief. I think everyone was expecting that there wouldn't be major tax increases. And fortunately, we didn't see tax increases. So there was roughly 13 billion that has been given back to businesses and to individuals. Um, and it was, it was, I think, you know, quite a good thing that, that, that we saw bracket creep adjustments and that we that we didn't see an increase in the road accident fund levy or the general fuel levy. Um, and so I think that we can all be quite happy with that. And of course, we've got the incentive allowances that were given and the rebate for solar. Um, and we've also got the, um, the diesel rebate uh, for, f for food manufacturers, which is quite important in these times to try and stabilize mm. the cost of food, especially for the poorer households. Yeah. So hopefully that will filter through to them. And that's a, a topic that Tabi will pick on a little bit later on. But when you talk about the 13 billion rand tax relief, what does it actually mean for corporations and individuals? Well, essentially it's made up largely of the, um, of, of the clean energy uh, uh, capital allowances for businesses, which is about five billion, uh, four billion for these uh, solar PV installations by individuals, where they'll get up to fifteen thousand rand per person back um, for one year. The corporation one is is two years, um, and and that's what largely makes it up. And then, of course, we've also got this diesel uh, rebate that's going to be given for the for the fuel manufacturers. Yeah. Thanks for that, David. Well, let's turn attention now to um, Edward Kisvetter, our SARS commissioner. The minister gave you a lovely gold star yesterday because you've done so well at tax, uh, you know, tax collection and for running an effective tax administration. Um, but he also gave you a shot in the arm. So in addition to direct allocation for capital and ICT projects, you're getting cash for your ability to be able to get cash from everyone else in South Africa. How are you going to be using this to sharpen your teeth? Well, maybe explain to you, thank you, Iman, that uh, how we have been using the additional funding. You'll recall um, that in the unfortunate period of state capture, SARS had lost... Um, I'm going to hand you the mic because we can't hear you. You will recall that during the unfortunate years of state capture, SARS had lost around 3,000 employees, many of them uh, very experienced. All right, I'm going to ask you to staff. pause there. I'll circle back to you because we're having some audio issues um, with your microphone. I definitely want to come back to these issues. But let's then turn our attention to one of the biggest issues and the pressures in our economy, which is around ESCOM. Um, electricity prices, I think some of us have forgotten the long view, exponentially risen by 862%, uh, Dr. Leoka, since 2007 to date. A lot of people have to choose between power and food. A lot of people are living beneath the bread line. We have a narrow definition of unemployment at 32%. Was there enough in this budget for the poorest among us? I think there was. So um, firstly, we did speak about the relief that we received from a tax perspective. So there were no tax increases, and I th uh, uh, especially on the income side. 
but also um, the poor were really uh, supported uh, from the levies that were mentioned earlier. Uh, but let's look at even the numbers from the, uh, the, the budget, where I think about 66 billion rand was allocated towards social development. Uh, about 36 billion rand was given to the social distress of relief, and that is the COVID, um, uh, COVID grant, and that was extended till 2024. And then I think uh, 30 billion rand was also extended to general social grants, so old age, uh, um, uh, children, and disability, etc. So it did protect the poor. But having said that, um, we have just over 18 million South Africans who are reliant on social grants or recipients of social grants. And then we have an additional 7 million South Africans who are who receive the social uh, grant of uh, distress, uh, the, the, uh, the COVID grant. So that is about 25 million South Africans are receiving some form of support from the state. We should be talking next year and the following year, uh, we should be reducing that number. And that is a measure of success of a social um, uh, yeah. grant system not an increase of people that are reliant on social grant. And that means that some of our policies, some of our economic policies are not working to ensure that uh, fewer people are reliant on social grants. Well, well here, here's where the stresses come in. And, and Kevin, I want to put this to you. Our debt burden is now crossing the five trillion rand mark. It's a historic mark that we're crossing for the first time over the next three years. And this is mainly due to the 250 billion rand partial takeover of ESCOM's debt, which is going to go straight to government's balance sheet. Uh, our debt is high, so our debt servicing costs are also going to be high. How big is the hole that South Africa is in when it comes to servicing our debt? So it's enormous, right? Um, so go back to when Trevor Manuel was Minister of Finance and he finished his term of office 2009. And he left as Minister of Finance, government debt was 26% of GDP, 26%. South Africa's credit rating was an A rating from Moody's. We forget that. At some point we had an A rating from Moody's, incredible. Fast forward from 2009 till now, Government debt over 70% of GDP. That's a 74%, percent, I believe, it stabilized that. And, and likely to rise further, according to the minister. If you look at the credit rating, obviously well below investment grade. So one of the questions you could ask yourself is, from 2009 until now, that's a, we've lost a lot of money. We spent a lot. What did we get in return for that spending? Very, very little. And now we're giving... ESCOM 254 billion to assist with their balance sheet. So that gives you some sense of the difficulty we've got ourselves into. And obviously that puts a constraint on the economy, an enormous constraint. And I think it's, it's clearly gonna take us a long period of time to get on top of that. I think the minister is doing what he can to, to, to correct the path, if you like. But he's limited by the environment in which he finds himself. He's limited by the lack of economic growth. He's limited by the high unemployment and the number of people receiving social grants. He's limited by mm. the narrow tax base in this country. He's facing a huge number of limits, right? So, so in, this, in this budget, I think it was incredibly skillful what he did to try and manage all these different components, all the different f competing forces, and I think he did a good job. Right. But in the end of the day, uh, the debt level is enormous. The debt servicing cost is almost 20% of our revenue. That means, sorry, almost 20% of every rand that you yeah. pay in taxes yeah. goes on interest, just the interest yeah. cost. That's the extent of the damage yeah. we've caused I think ourselves. the precise number is 21 cents. Actually, I was reading a, a figure somewhere. Uh, Edward, I, I, I want to come back to you. Uh, what we're expecting, and to go back to the question I asked you earlier, tax collection revenue expected to hit the 1.69 trillion mark um, for the next, for, for the end of this financial year. It's almost as if the burden to make up for some of the deficits that um, Kevin and Tabi were talking about lies with your office, with everything that you've got. I mean, is there still enough? I don't want to say blood to draw from because that might seem a bit rude, but <laughs> is there still enough, or do we have to really start looking at alternative sources of revenue? 
You know, I, I often say that uh, there's a lot of good news in the bad news. And as, as uh, Kevin and others have said, we have come through an inordinately difficult decade and more since those wonderful days. I remember as Deputy Commissioner, we delivered the first budget surplus in 2007, which was then just wiped away because of the financial crisis in 2008. And to claw back is going to require resilience, commitment at a political, but also at the level of execution. My own sense is we have less of a policy challenge and more of an implementation challenge. But we keep hearing this. Well, and until we address it um, and develop a capable state based on meritocratic principles, we will not be able to fix it. Um, we have to appoint people with integrity, people who are competent, and if they don't deliver, they should be dealt with. Consequence management is important. Um, so, so the, uh, let me come back to my point about the bad news contains good news. What is the bad news? We have seen a decline in compliance levels over the last number of years. We have seen a decline in tax morality. We have seen a proliferation of uh, corruption, often state-sponsored corruption. Um, we have seen an increase in criminal syndicates who defraud the system. That's the bad news. The good news is that if we build a competent revenue authority that's able to administer its laws without fear, favor, and prejudice, that builds deep competence, we can improve compliance levels, and we've seen that mm. uh, in the last three years, increased by about three percentage points. We've seen the confidence that South Africans have in the revenue authority increase. We have also, in the last two years, um, you will recall last year, the collection was almost 200 billion, more than what was predicted a year before, and this year we're heading for 94. So if you add that, it's 300 billion that the minister does not have to go and borrow, yeah. on which there will not be interest paid. So I think the investment into a competent revenue authority is very critical for our recovery and for the maintenance of the integrity of the fiscal framework. And we are encouraged that the work we are doing is beginning to bear fruit and South Africa is beginning yeah. to harvest a compliance dividend. And, and speaking about bearing fruit, you're zeroing in on individual taxpayers and syndicates. I think you've managed to recover about three billion with regard to that tax collection effort. But I want to talk about the ESCOM elephant and it, it's gonna, I think, be foundational to our discussion uh, today in some ways. Uh, Andre de Reiter, uh, didn't only drop the mic, he took a sledgehammer to the windows, in a sense, uh, at ESCOM, dividing opinion, and this is the point I'm making, some people think uh, Andre de Reiter, the outgoing CEO of, of, of ESCOM, is a patriot and a whistleblower um, who was made to basically fail um, in, 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 in his role. And others say that his track record leaves much to be desired and he should have named names and been more explicit in this context where we're trying to root out corruption about who the problematic people are, uh, you know, and blocking the recovery of ESCOM. I would love your thoughts um, on, on his exit and what's needed now critically at ESCOM. And let's not forget, uh, Edward Kisveta was boss of the year at ESCOM back in 1999. But then you were a, a power general manager, I think. You know, you remind me that I'm old while I was sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> I received an SMS from the Eskom Pension Fund to tell me that the pensioners event had been moved to the 8th of, uh, or the 6th of April. So <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing in this room. I should be retired. <laughs> um, but so let me first talk about the, the, the challenge at Eskom. And obviously when organizations do well, the CEO is often credited, and often undeservingly so, because in my case, it's nice to be the poster boy, but we have 12,500 people who do many little things right every day to produce the 1.692 trillion. But CEOs get the flack when things, get the credit when things go, go well, and they should get the, uh, the flack when things don't go well. And I think it is unfortunate 
that uh, the CEO in his final days begun to say things that maybe you could have said earlier. Um, and I think it leaves an unfortunate bad taste uh, in the mouth. Um, in terms of the focus that Eskom needs and a new CEO would have to focus on is we have almost 48,000 megawatts installed that feeds off coal. You cannot ignore that and focus only on renewables. Of course you need a just transition, but we would not be able to build enough solar and wind and other renewables to replace the 32,000 maximum demand that we need every day. And so therefore, the new leadership of Eskom has to make the plant work. We have seen a decline in plant performance in energy availability factor, and the yeah. leadership of, of Eskom have to take accountability for that. What should he have done better? I, I think, and, and it's always hard to, to criticize a colleague, but I think the leadership of Eskom in, in taking on the mantle of the just energy transition may have emphasized maybe a stronger bias towards that transition and in the process accepted that the plant performance um, would not improve. And I think having been in the seat of running a power station, I think that as South Africans, we must expect a better performance from the current installed capacity to simply argue that these power stations are old and therefore will underperform does not explain the 47% availability of Kosile that right. is a brand new power station. I know you've got a point of view on this, Tabi. Go ahead. Yes, so, um, you know, I think that, and I, you know, if, if, um, if a CEO is not performing, especially a CEO of a state-owned entity, they have a principle, and the principle in this, in this regard is uh, Department of Public Enterprises. And so if you're not performing in year one, you get a review, and you are under some review process. If you're not performing six months after that review process, then the discussion about your dismissal should take place. If you've been there for three years and your principal has supported you throughout, even publicly, even when the public has criticized you, up until the week before the interview, where your principal is saying, actually, you know, he was poisoned, and that's a demonstration of the hard work and also the, the, the corruption that he was exposing. And then when you then talk, and your principal and everyone else says, but you were actually incompetent, that I have a problem with. So he was there for three years. When did he become incompetent? Is it year one or year three when he started to speak and then suddenly you're pulling that incompetence uh, you know, bell to yeah. say actually you need to come out. And, and this is just general we use business as well. If, if a CEO is not performing in the, uh, in the private sector, they leave immediately because you're a cost to the entity. So it's just the duration is a problem and the response is a problem. All right, I know we can talk about this for the entire broadcast, actually, but we can't because there are other areas that we need to touch on. Kevin, I want to look at municipal debts uh, with regard to, to ESCOM, just as a kind of wrapping conversation on the ESCOM point. Um, 56.3 billion, that debt is rising. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's quite a risky scenario that we are in. Um, and if ESCOM is taking on ESCOM's, I mean, if government is taking on ESCOM's debt, why is it not writing off the debts um, that are owed by the municipality and should it? There are some fixes that the minister introduced about giving prepaid meters and so on. Has he gone the right route? Is this going to be, but it's not going to be a panacea for all our ills on ESCOM, but is this the <coughs> right route? So from, uh, from Eskom's point of view, yes, undoubtedly, in terms of trying to stabilize the balance sheet of Eskom, it's part of the fix. It's not the fix. It's not a solution in itself. But it's part of the process of trying to get to a better energy position. You can't allow Eskom to essentially be bankrupt and then try and invest in, in uh, power generation. So I, c I can see that that would hurt. $254 billion is an inordinate amount of money. And you, what are you achieving with that? Very little that on the face but it's an important first step in the right direction. It has to be followed up by a number of things, obviously. 
including the restructuring of ESCOM, including a better focus on power generation. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. The municipal debt is a critical thing, right? We're fooling ourselves here. We're absolutely fooling ourselves. We keep thinking that somehow, miraculously, that money is going to be paid back. Why would it suddenly now be paid back? And quite frankly, where's the money going to come from to make that payment? Mm. Most households are, that are in that situation can barely survive given the cost of living. So we need to draw a line in the sand and try and establish better principles going forward. That doesn't mean that we have to set that as the principle. In other words, every time you can't make a payment, the, the debt just builds up and we forgive it. But we can't, we can't fool ourselves, and Eskom, importantly, can't fool itself thinking that it has that money due to it and it's going to receive that. I think we've got to come up with a solution. I see it the same way that we do the, toll, the tolling system in Johannesburg. It simply didn't work, and we finally made a political decision on that, and I think everybody's better off for it. Yeah. I think we've got to do the same thing with municipal debt, but then find a way to move forward from there. Can right. I add? Yeah, sure. And, and not only just find a way, and, it's, it, and it links up with the ESCOM problem, that um, you have to capacitate these municipalities with people who can actually run them efficiently. Which so we that hear they from the AG debt. every year. Mm. Similarly with ESCOM, you can remove your, you can do fancy financial footwork, but if you don't put competent people to take it forward, what stops ESCOM from being in another financial rut in yeah. an, a few years' important. time? And yeah. that's the question we should be asking ourselves. So I know we've been talking in glowing terms uh, about SARS, well, relatively speaking, but I know that David has got one bugbear that represents the audit profession <laughs> with regard to SARS. Go for it, David. You've got precisely two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I wanted to just ask uh, the commissioner is, you know, from a um, tax practitioner point of view and dealing with, with clients, the affairs on, 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 on their behalf with SARS, um, we have a sort of a mixed experience, I'll put it that way, that sometimes things work well at SARS and timelines are adhered to, especially with disputes and things like that. And, and the dispute resolution uh, uh, sort of phase is, is dealt with very efficiently. But then there are other times when, uh, when SARS gets behind and it doesn't abide by, by those times. Um, you know, you have assessments that are raised for without any merit, and then you object, you send the whole wad of documentation in, um, and the, someone doesn't really apply their mind to it, and they, they just, you know, raise an assessment, or even, even worse, it, you know, uh, it, it, it ends up at the appeal stage where, where it n never should, should end up. So my question is just with the budget allocations that have been given, Commissioner, do you believe now that you've got enough resources um, to sort of, you know, improve SARS's service delivery. I'm not okay. saying it's completely, you know, in the shambles, but... Um, oh, just if you believe that, you can... Yeah. No, I know you don't believe <laughs> that. <I'm joking. laughs> but, but, but where it's defective, do you, do you believe that, that you've got enough resources to improve yeah. it, or do you still need to build on that? Uh, it's funny you say you have a mixed experience with us, because we have a mixed experience with you. And <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> not all audit firms are created equal. Um, Look, let me first of all say that to, to the point about capacity, if we, some of us are old enough to remember that you used to send volumes and volumes of documents to SARS, proof of everything, you used to manually fill out your declaration. Mm. And you can think now about how efficient that would have been to process almost everything manually by human beings. Today we are in a world where we have already done the following. For three million taxpayers, they don't have to do anything. Why? Because we are drawing increasingly more on third-party data, we do not rely on declarations by individuals, and we use machine learning algorithms to compute the outcome and present it to people. So we're able to do that with standard taxpayers, but as our store of data expands and increase, and as our ability to impute data science uh, and artificial intelligence, that work will be less reliant on the declaration by taxpayers, but equally less reliant on human beings within SARS. That's the clear trajectory that we are on. 
we do drop the ball. We drop the ball for several reasons. Can I ask you to take a breath? We'll come back to the several reasons just after the break. If you want to. Okay. <laughs> I'm finally having uh, the final word over the, the, co the stars commissioner, which is fantastic. Um, we're going to take a short ad break. We'll come back to questions in the room. And if you're just joining us, we are at the Cape Town International Convention Center in our special SABC BDO South Africa broadcast. Stay with us. Okay, guys, please, uh, we are about to go on air again. Um, let's have our phone on silence. We would clap hands again, and then she'll welcome, welcome us back. Thank you. Okay, just to let you guys know, I want to take a maybe 90-second answer from uh, Commissioner, and then I'll come to the questions. 30 seconds back to us, everyone. <laughs> Lots of spirit here in the auditorium at the Cape Town International Convention Center. If you're just joining us, we are in a special joint broadcast with the SABC and BDO South Africa. Just remember, if you want to weigh in on the conversation, tweet us using the hashtag FullView. And uh, SARS Commissioner Edward Kisvetter was answering a question, and I think it began with the words dropping the ball. So let's just get the answer from uh, Edward Kisvetter. So, and, I, and I, I would like to believe that we drop the ball fewer times than what we catch the ball. Um, and I think most people's experience would bear that out. The, the challenges we still have is we have a clear commitment to complete work within a particular turnaround time. And clearly the volume of cases we often generate means that we don't have enough staff to work at the rate that we do. And then we do have instances where an auditor or a verifier um, may get it wrong. Yeah. You will know, those of you who are not Luddites, who have uh, yourself visited on Twitter, that I personally am on Twitter and I, I manage my own Twitter. I don't have a team that sits behind me um, because I put myself out there to feel the pain and the experience of taxpayers. It's the only way that I will be able to truly understand the experience. I go and stand in the queues and listen to taxpayers. So it will take time uh, firstly, to improve the capacity and the capability of our staff, but also increasingly to automate routine tasks and to be res less reliant on the processing of information between taxpayers and practitioners, oh sorry, between SARS and practitioners or SARS and taxpayers, um, and allow that work to be done um, with uh, supercomputers using uh, machine learning algorithms. So that's the journey we are on. My invitation has always been that when there is a service issue, we will um, absolutely, with all earnest, respond to it. We, you also know that we have a unit that deals with practitioners um, and with um, registered complaining right. bodies. Thanks so much for that, Commissioner. And, and if there's time, we'll, we'll probably come back and, and revisit some of the, the ease of accessibility, both in, in, you know, for corporate uh, players and also for individuals. 
But right now, we're going to turn the microphone over to our audience. And I think we're kicking off with questions uh, from Brian. We'll take a few questions here from the Cape Town International Convention Center. And then we're going to pop you over to KZN and Mshlanga and find out what the BDO team there is also thinking about. Oh, hi, it's not Brian. It is Brian. Go, go for it. Thank you. Um, firstly, I think the minister must be commended. Uh, the commissioner? Uh, no, no, the minister. Oh, the minister. Right yeah, Good. For addressing the big issues, yeah. but maintaining fiscal discipline. Right? Um, I think, however, the elephant in the room is the public sector wage bill. What are, what are your confidence levels with respect to those negotiations and the ability to achieve an outcome which is sustainable but doesn't negatively impact on service delivery? We've spoken quite a bit about meritocracy um, and, and a capable state. How do we balance that? What are your, what are your confidence levels to, to manage that negotiation right. effectively? Thanks for that question. We have a second one. Yes, good day. Um, my question is just with regards to the um, solar tax rebate incentive. Um, for those individuals and businesses that have already incurred that tax in 2022, what benefits or are there, if any, for those? Mm. And whether there'll be a retrospective application yes. of the provision. All right, two questions on this side. My name is Siaj Mohammed. My question is with regards to the morale and confidence of South Africans being at the all-time low at this point in time. How does one reconcile the treasury spending, billions of our surplus, on failing SOEs like Post Office, SAA, and ESCOM? Thank you. Thank you so much. Go for it. Hi, my name is Paul Westbank. And also with regards to the solar tax incentive, the question I have, perhaps in the language of the commissioner, is on the good news side, or on the bad news side rather, uh, there's going to be 250,000 people that would invest, you know, 200,000 rand to get a 15,000 rand tax deduction, right, to actually keep putting electricity back into the grid. Presumably the same uh, taxpayers that are already in the top bracket in the personal income tax. So give us the good news, Commissioner. How many stages of load shedding are we going to buy with that incentive that we are, with that, with that star tax? <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Let's uh, take us then to KwaZulu-Natal and to BDO's Amshlanga offices. And our reporter, Jade Lee Porter, is there. Jade, what are you hearing? Well, a very good evening to you, Oman, and to the viewers back at home. And yes, I've seen a lot of nodding heads, so I think... Supposed to hear that. All right, so I think we're having some audio <laughs> problems. I, I'm a good lip reader, but I'm not that good. So I can't tell you what the question was. But I think on that note, we will take a break, reestablish our comms with KZN. You can all take a breather. And please do join us when we come back as we begin to take uh, some answers to those questions and some closing remarks. Remember, it's not only an architectural conversation. There are a lot of South Africans who are suffering psychologically from what's happening in the country. Are worst days yet to come in this democracy of ours? Or is there light? at the end of the tunnel. I know somebody will say the light is an oncoming train, but that's not the answer. <laughs> Stay with us. We'll be back straight after this. Break, please. Don't move on your seats. As I told you, the time would fly. Yeah, Can you believe that it's shots? what time is it? Probably quarter two. I know it's eight. It's it's only six thirty. That's fine. We've got time. Jade, hi. It's Iman. Can you hear me now? Hi, Iman. There you are. We can hear you now. I don't know what happened with your mic. Okay. All right, Jade, just um, just give me a sense of what's happening in the room. We're just oh, yeah. Also, let's see. There we go. Back. Okay. They seem to be back, Lucia. 
Okay, so I'll just throw again to Durban. We'll take that question and come back. What was yours again? Thank you very much for staying with us on this special broadcast between the SABC and BDO SA. We are going to the Mshlanga office in KZN, and that's where our reporter Jade Lee Porter is having a conversation with some of the staffers there. Jade, what are they asking? Welcome back to KwaZulu Natal, Durban, and yes, we are engaging some of the BDO members. I was just chatting to Basil Thomas here, who was talking to me off air. Basil, just pose your question once again. I think uh, for many of us, both individuals and corporates, when we listened to the budget speech, we sort of um, had a sigh of relief and, and pretty much saw it as a stay-as-you-are budget. But then that then raises the question is, was this an economic budget or was it really just a political budget? That's the question. Well, there you hear Imal. I'm just going to try and engage one more individual. Let's see, Joshua Thistle. I'm sure you have a lot to say and to ask. Yeah, just a simple question. I think there's a fair amount allocated for the next couple of years in terms of infrastructure spend. We're reaching the trillion billion mark. And uh, I think the question is always asked is that what assurance or how is government ensuring that that money is being well spent and uh, reaching the ground in terms of bricks and mortar spend, uh, the bulk of it at least, yeah. Well, very pertinent questions coming from this leg of the BDO event happening here in Umtlanga. I'm going to hand it back to you as we engage some of the members back behind. Thank you very much, uh, Jade Lee. So there you have some of the questions um, that are being asked, and I think we'll take a moment now to really reflect on those, and maybe we kick off, uh, Tabi, we'll kick yeah. off with you on the public sector wage bill. Uh, I think 45.6 billion rand was the allocation that the finance minister the made. Uh, this is just to kind of make up for the carry-through costs. However, we know that the unions have reacted to this. We, we saw what they said today. This is not something they, they're expecting, warning of intensified labor action over the next few weeks. How, how, how did South Africa get over this sort of well, it's not an unexpected hurdle because it's been brewing for many weeks now? For many years. Remember that uh, uh, government reneged on the public sector uh, uh, wage agreement in 2020 and it actually went to the Constitutional Court where government actually won using KZ as, as part of the, the, ra the rationale for not paying it out. This time around it's going to be very difficult for government not to uh, pay the, the uh, wages but the, the, the question is what is the increase and it will obviously be very punitive to our fiscus because this is especially if it's higher than what is expected and what is was um, expected in the budget uh, in terms of disruptions we don't know we obviously don't want disruptions we can ill afford disruptions right now in this economy um, but people are angry, and people are angry for various reasons. It's very easy to, um, to agitate people, and we just don't want, especially public sector wage, uh, 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 workers to be agitated. Okay. Just, uh, uh, can I answer some of the other questions? Sure. So on, on the morale and confidence, I think that is a very critical question that we seem to ignore. We talk about load shedding, load shed stage six, but we, and then we talk about, oh, we need to be productive and, and um, we need to s be resilient and have hope. But it's very difficult to be resilient and have hope when for 16 years we've been talking about this whole electricity crisis. When you get home after a long day of work, you, you can't even warm up food. Um, you can't even warm up your child's bot milk bottle. Uh, you can't watch TV. You can't do what you used to do, which is what normal people do everywhere else in the world. So I think we are a depressed nation. And, and I don't know what the mental consequences of that are, but you can't expect a depressed mm. nation to be productive. And yeah. that is what I'm fearing as an economist, is that we're not going to see the productivity levels even in a very tight economic con uh, economy w uh, because of just the general morale has just been, mm. I I it's, it's declining and decaying. 
Well, as we bed down the conversation a little bit later on, hopefully we can look to uh, the opportunities that exist in, in our economy. Let's go, Kevin, to whether this was a political budget or not. No, I don't think it was a political budget. I think what you would have hoped, and I think what the question was alluding to, it's a fair question, is does the budget move the country forward? Are we going to see a significant change or development as a consequence of the budget? And, and you would say, no, there aren't any big significant announcements that's going to change the game, if you like. But I think that's unfair in the sense that it's not recognizing the constraints. And this, the constraints are enormous. So given those constraints, what can the minister do? And there's a big constraint that I think people don't necessarily fully appreciate, and that is you've got to, you've got to appeal to foreign investors. You've got to appeal to credit rating agencies. You've got to show discipline. It's not just about let's spend a whole lot of money, let's try to drive this economy by investing in ports and rail, et cetera, and just, just go for it and get the economy going. That would be beautiful. The problem is that what is the foreign investor going to do? We, we as a country, we are absolutely reliant on foreign investment. I could, there's very few things you can say categorically about South Africa, but you can say this categorically. South Africa cannot be economically successful without foreign investment. And as a consequence of that, when the minister crafts the budget, he's got to take all of these constraints into account. When I look at it, I think he did a good job given the constraints. What Tabi's saying is 100% right. You've got to lift the economy more broadly than that. And that's about what we were discussing earlier, implementation. The policy framework is there. There's nothing wrong with it. Just go and implement the damn stuff. And then you'll make a bigger difference to South Africa. And we're just letting ourselves down. And we listen to the minister. It's not his job to implement. His job is to allocate the funds to the departments who then implement. And I think we, we, we put in too much weight on what's achievable from National Treasury. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's a sobering point because if you think about the Auditor General's report and you think about why municipalities, uh, municipalities that are dysfunctional are so, it's because they don't have the skill set in many, in many respects to be able to run proper finances, make sure that the MMFA is, you know, is properly adhered to, that there is good governance. And we might come back to this issue. Let's talk about, um, David, if we can, and, and, and uh, Edward, if we can with you as well, Commissioner, around the, the tax incentives. Mm. And uh, you know, we talked about what's the allocation for business and what the allocation for private residents are, uh, residents are going to be. But what is, I mean, would it be retrospective? No, it's not going to be retrospective. So um, for individuals, uh, you have to bring the, the uh, solar panels into use in a private home uh, in this next tax year. So there's only one tax year in which to do that. If you've already spent the money, you're not going to be able to get anything. Um, for and, and it's, it's up to f a maximum of, of 15,000 per person, per individual. Um, and it's 25% of, of the spend just on the, on the solar panels, but up, you know, up to the 15,000. So you know, looking at that from an overall point of view, take the $4 billion that, is, that that's supposed to be worth in the budget in terms of give back, Four billion divided by fifteen thousand, you land up with about two hundred and sixty-six thousand homes that are supposed to then do this, you know, in, in, in order to use this within this one year period. And I must say I don't think it's going to make anyone rush out and, and invest in solar panels in their home because it's very expensive to do so. And there are a whole lot of other costs around the installation of the panels. And one understands from a policy perspective why, for example, inverters aren't part of what they're trying to incentivize and why the connectivity, the sort of, you know, wiring and installation isn't part of it. Um, but I, I just think that the amount maybe is, you know, should have maybe been double that. Maybe that would have made the, a, a difference. I think what's going to happen is people that were going to do it anyway are now going to go out and do it. So I, c I can't think that it's going to make a difference to the decision yeah. whether or not to go and install it. And then just on the allowance with regard to businesses, it's 125%, um, but once again, of the cost of uh, plant machinery, et cetera, that, that is brought into use within a two-year period that commences from 1 March of this year and goes through to 2020, uh, 2025, end of February 2025. Um, if you've already spent the money and you're a business, the way I read it is you'd be able then to claim under the existing provision 
which gives essentially, if it well, if it's solar p PV panels, then um, uh, if it's less than one megawatt, you can write a hundred percent off in the year that you bring it into use. If it's more, it's spread over three years, fifty, thirty, twenty of the cost. That's how I read the. Yeah. I don't know if there are any it. comments from anyone else on the panel on any of those questions, but I want to go to grey listing, which if I think I can just is really important. Go ahead. Mention uh, the issue of, um, of how many stages of load shedding. I think there's, there's multiple um, initiatives that's trying to address load shedding. Obviously, uh, trying to allow more individuals and businesses to become self-reliant um, is an important intervention because every every watt, every kilowatt, every megawatt that is not required takes some pressure off the grid. Eskom at the moment, uh, on a good day, can only reliably schedule 26,000 megawatts. And on a good day, our maximum demand is 32,000 megawatts. So we have a shortfall of six. And then if they have other unplanned breakdowns, that increases. So you would hope that in the next two years, through a combination of these incentivized investments uh, in, in renewables, Eskom is also committed that in the next two years, it will be able to restore on the existing capacity reliably um, about 4,700 uh, megawatts. Um, and then more and more companies are becoming self-reliant. So I'm confident that over the next two years, we will dig ourselves out of the hole uh, of the current load shedding crisis, but it's not going to be overnight. Um, but it's not also going to be one silver bullet. It's going to be a combination of, uh, if you look at the Western Cape and other provinces following, there's an absolute resolute commitment by Cape Town and the Western Cape, for example, to decrease their dependence and increase their, their, their own generation capacity. And I think more municipalities and, and provinces will follow. So I'm confident that uh, over the next two years, uh, we will be through this stuff. I also want to comment on the state of depression. And there's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy in this, right? That um, we can be as depressed as we choose to be or we can count our blessing. Now, it is absolutely wrong to be in denial about mm. the challenges we face. Yeah. That would be, you're either smoking something or, or <laughs> you need serious therapy. But, so we have serious challenges. When you travel the world, okay, you begin to see that there are, there are global challenges, energy crises, climate challenges, food supply chain interruptions. And the people in this room are inordinately privileged compared to many, many millions of South Africans. You know, when Cape Town was moaning day zero, people in the township said, we've always had day zero mm -hmm. because we don't have the services. And I think it is incumbent on every single one of us to make a decision do you want to be part of the problem or part of the solution? Because South Africa will not change when the government takes out some magic wand and improves. South Africa has always changed when there is active citizenry, when people say, so far and no further. And I'd like to challenge every South African to ask themselves, what am I doing to improve the situation in South Africa? I spoke to you that I'm an active member of the Eskom Pension Fund. I am. But four years ago, I made the decision that I'm going to accept the challenge to try and make a difference instead of just sitting on the side and complaining. And I think more of us must get beyond this us and them mentality and see this as our country and we want to change it and leave a legacy for our own children. Yeah. I wish you'd saved us for the end. This is pretty good. <laughs> When we come back in the closing minutes of our open debate discussion here at uh, the Cape Town International Convention Center, we'll take a short break and we'll be back straight after.
Lisha, you spoke into my ear, and uh, <laughs> did I make sense? Yeah, D because I forgot what I was sense. saying. Uh, there was uh, someone talking <laughs> to me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Perfect. Until seven. So we only have seven minutes. Six minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> Every time I ask, it keeps going down by a minute. Tell me, Anka, is it six? Can we go to 57? For weather, 57. Okay, so here's our challenge. I, I really have to talk about grey listing. So somebody needs to pick that, and then I'll take closing comments from from the others. So, who want you'll you'll do grey listing? Kavi, you want to end with the with the with the closing? You'll do a closing for us. Of grey listing? No, I no, no. Oh. I'll listing. give Kevin the grey listing question. Listing, you want to do grey listing? No, I can. Please. Yeah. I do listing. Forty seconds no, back to us. Well. Okay, guys, I implore you to just keep it really <laughs> succinct. <laughs> Do it again. <laughs> Do it again. <laughs> okay, I promise you that everyone clapping here is genuinely happy. We're back with the program and we're going to take some closing comments. It has been an education, but also some sobering realizations in our broadcast today. Before we get our panel to wrap, I just want to ask a question around the threat of grey listing. And Commissioner, I'll quickly put that to you. The NPA has got more money. I think it's a 1.3 billion rand specifically. The Financial Action Task Team, of course, is holding us. I, I won't say holding us over a barrel, but they've created some com conditions and recommendations that we have to abide with in order to avoid a grey listing. Did the Finance Minister, have we as a country done enough um, to put money into prosecuting around the State Capture Commission recommendations, all the things we needed to do to stave this off? I believe the decision is, is still this week. So the additional money that the Minister has allocated won't affect the decision that will be taken tomorrow in Paris. Um, but we also need to remind ourselves that when the mutual FACAP evaluation was done in 2019, we were at the low point just coming out of state capture before the new administration came into power. And I can say, having been involved in addressing some of the weaknesses, we have come a significant way to addressing the issues. The, the system, however, is very tick the box. So if you end up with any actions, we started uh, with uh, over 130 actions. We're probably down to low double digits. Um, of actions that we still need to do. Um, and it pretty much will depend on whether they regard that the progress we have made plus the outstanding actions will be completed within a sufficiently short time to make the decision. Um, but I think, grey listing or not, we can take heart that we have come a long way and that the collective force of the NPA, the Hawks, uh, South African, uh, Revenue Service um, and the FIC have, as a system, is significantly stronger today than what it was in 2019. He said we probably may not succeed in staving it off. What is your prediction for how that goes? I don't want to tell them what to say tomorrow. <laughs> um, look, I think that uh, one of the outcomes that we are preparing ourselves for is that um, the committee will consider that we haven't completed all the task, and that's a fact, whether or not they believe that those tasks... So if they take a view that we can complete the outstanding actions within the next 6 to 12 months, they will be more cautious mm. to grey list us. But if they think that we will take three years to do so, then clearly they're going to lean more to grey listing. So in closing, my final challenge to you is to manage your time as well as you manage your money. I'm going to give you 30 seconds for a closing comment that really, I mean, this conversation by no means it, it covers and encapsulates everything. We've covered some of the, the, the key points. 
What do you say to people who are grappling with transitioning psychologically, making a plan for them, their families, being solution-oriented, like the commissioner said? What is your message to South Africans? David, I'll, I'll start with you. Kevin, you, and then Tavia, I'll give you the final word. I tend to think that we now, at such a low point, that uh, things should get better from here. I, th I think that's another <laughs> way of looking at it. <laughs> so we're coming <laughs> off a low base. So I think one's, one's got it. I love that. It, it, it's a very 100-acre wood statement to make. <laughs> things can only get better from here. Very Tigger. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, yeah, there's undoubtedly a, a myriad of challenges. And, uh, and I just want to pick up on what Edward said. I agree wholeheartedly. We can... We can wallow in those challenges and keep repeating them or we can find a solution. And my sense is in the last while, business is getting on with stuff. People are making the decisions for themselves and I think you're going to see more of that. And it's no longer just a question of waiting for government to implement policy. I think this time next year, you're going to find that business has moved on, society's moved on. And if government doesn't want to be part of that, well, probably there will be consequences. But I do get a sense that society has had enough and they're willing to make key changes now in order to ensure that they better their lives. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> Tabi galvanized the nation. You know, I'm trying to be positive and to look for a silver lining. And I'm, I'm listening to everyone. I'm realizing actually I'm the youngest one, but I'm, I'm the one who's fatigued the most. <laughs> uh, but I'm also one who's interacted with government and helped government and helped, you know, the presidency. So. It's not like I'm talking out of um, a, you know, a space of not understanding the, 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 uh, the challenges, but also I understand the beasts behind the challenges. Mm. And so it, I think, I think peop South Africans are contributing. I think corporate is contributing, has mm. been. I think that we just all need to listen to each other mm. and forge a, a path together in unison. Um, and if we don't, we're going to collapse this country. Thank you so much to our panel. <laughs> so as we wrap our, our bulletin, we'll quote the philosophies from comic books uh, around the world that we grew up reading. This can either be a moment for us to tap into our superpower or be completely de debilitated by the kryptonite that is in our environment right now. I did pretty well, I think, with that little analogy. <laughs> we're going to leave our broadcast there. Thank you so much for watching. We will continue our discussion in the room. And don't forget, you can... Uh, catch this full broadcast on our YouTube channels. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Take care. <laughs> hey, thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for all the clapping. So our official broadcast has ended. Now we can like unlock.